Brilliant. Right, I'm, I'm, gonna go down, I'm just going to go downstairs, so let's hope we don't get lost. Perfect. I'm going to go downstairs. Oh, this is all so wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> Old-fashioned technology. That's very weird about that Facebook thing. Yeah. Right, I'm going, you're going in here, and you've still got me, and we're lovely. Everything's great. Okay, man, I'm ready. It's even better wow. than it would have been the other way. Probably, yes. Yeah. Except it's not live. I wonder if I actually start the live thing on the phone and just have people see you and then I'll upload the actual thing. Yeah, right. okay, if you want, that's yeah. fine. Yeah, yeah. That, that would be probably you want, man. a setting. Let's see. I don't think people will... It's, it's not the best of all worlds, but... Uh, no. Don't make do. Uh, <laughs> live. <laughs> oh, my God. On it episode. tells me you're recording the call. It's actually telling me that, you see. Uh -huh. hey, don't you dare record this call, man. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> it's the, the phone's tapped. Uh, yeah, exactly. Everything's tapped, mate. You've got to accept that everything is tapped. I'm going to write. Uh, let's see. A, a high-end version. Will be... <laughs> will be released. Hilarious. <laughs> yeah, hilarious. Release after. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Just position this phone and we're good to go. Let's see what's yeah, a typical spot. This guy. Hmm. <laughs> right, cool. One second, one second. Almost there. Okay. No, 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 hurry. I'm fine. Can't figure out. I, I can't figure out that. Maybe it only works in, you know, the next up iPhone or something. Maybe that's it. Anyway, here we All are. All right. Here we Great, are. Man. Exactly. Good to see you. Finally. <laughs> so, John. Yeah, I, man. This is the, the place I want to start is. Uh, yeah really talking about what your generation did to mine because <laughs> for some reason we can't even call ourselves fusion anymore because what happened in the 80s what were you guys on well i'll you... tell you what well, first of all what we did to you we got cheap houses <laughs> <laughs> we could buy houses in new york or london and you could certainly won't be able to sorry apart from that so fusion you can't use the word Interesting. So, so say, say that again. You can't use the word fusion. Well, I mean, in the 70s, it was quite the amazing idiom. And you guys rocked. You know, I love all yeah. the stuff. You know, exactly. you guys, yeah. Like, exactly. out there shooting, you had massive audiences. Yeah. And then you guys just do, did too much blow, I think. And... Uh... <laughs> Not me, brother. <laughs> I'm still here. Well, you can I tell. Know. The ones that aren't here are the ones who did too much blow. <laughs> Touch wood, I'm still here. No, well, I tell you what, no, serious point, actually. I mean, the thing is, uh, it got to be, I don't know if this is what you're kind of uh, getting at, but it got to be a bit of a, particularly over here, a bit of a dirty word. But, you know, when, the, when you might say the first fusion records, like In a Silent Way and Larry Coriel's Spaces and John McLaughlin's Extrapolation and, and it was a tremendously vital feeling and, and a really exciting period. The first Weather Report albums and all that. I just tend to think if we're talking about music, that, you know, things got a little bit stale towards the end of the 70s. And, the, so, and then, of course, yeah. And then it became a dirty word with Wynton Marsalis and particularly those people in the early 80s. And you got the, the retro movement if we can call it that, you know. So so somebody like Masalis, for instance, for fusion would be a really dirty word. So yeah. we kind of spread that around. And, and I think, um, and over here, it became extremely unfashionable. I remember putting a band together in about 84, 85. And I said to the critic who came down, I said, oh, it's a great band. It's actually really like jazz rock. And he looked at me like I'd said something really stupid. <laughs> yeah, rock and actually you know 
but jazz rock was what we did in in we we called the soft machine jazz rock. That's what uh, we have to call it now. You call what well, you call it jazz rock? Yeah, yeah. No, that's cool, man. Fusion got this uh, connotation of the Hawaii shirt, the calculator watch, going on yes. stage shorts and plugging in like three DX sevens and letting it rip. Yes, it, it, exactly. Yes, exactly. I mean. It's just an image thing, isn't it? Fusion got a very bad image. I and mean, jazz rock to me is uh, actually, uh, I prefer that word. Yeah. I mean, I, I have the same thing about the word fusion. It's like, like a, oh, God, that, as you say, it's sort of Hawaiian shirts and, and uh, you know, um, cheesy grooves and, and lots of aimless blowing over the top. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> almost, ah. almost like smooth. Almost. In a way, kind of... It reminds me of the old cigarette commercials from the late 80s, early 90s, like of time cigarettes when you see like the oh, yeah. the person. Yeah. You remember those? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Hang yeah. on. I'm just going to go into. I'm just going to move rooms because you're getting a bit blurry. Sure. sure. Your, your voice, because I don't want to lose your your words of wisdom, Dan. Uh, let's right. let's lose this again. Here we are. Now yeah. That's all right. So I'm actually in the bedroom, but you can't see anything, so that's all right. Well, <laughs> let the people on the live feed know that this will be, we're doing it on Skype and I'm recording, and uh, we're right. going to, I'll upload it to our YouTube with a higher quality later. So yeah. uh, yeah, this is good. just for people who don't want to miss a moment in our lives. Yes, uh, exactly. <laughs> but you said something interesting that I've never heard before, which is that by the end of the 70s, it started feeling stale. In what yeah. way? Well, I think I think uh, there were certain like late elements of the late like Return to Forever stuff, and and it got a bit too. I mean, I love you see, I love the kind of uh, what would you say, pi um, a searching kind of pioneering spirit of say, in a silent way, or extrapolation, or Larry Coriel spaces, or those early ones. Where people, you know, they're not quite sure the terrain hasn't been mapped out. Mm -hmm. And once terrain is prop, is sort of mapped out, and people sort of slot into a thing called fusion, then, then to me, things can tend to get a bit. So that's what I like about the soft machine. It was, it actually, funny enough, in the seventies, the soft machine started getting a bit like that. But our soft machine, since we kind of reformed has somehow, because it's so eccentric, and all the players in it are, they're basically kind of themselves. I mean, for instance, if you say yeah. John Marshall on drums, if you say, get me a drummer, you wouldn't get John Marshall, because John Marshall does a thing that is unique to him. So you'd say, get me John Marshall, right? Mm -hmm. But not get me a drummer. And Roy Babington and Hugh Hopper before him, they're very kind of individual voices. And I think in, in what we, we're calling fusion music, that got a bit lost toward the end of the 70s because it became, because, uh, you know, paradoxically what you're saying about it being big business meant yeah. that it did become a little bit bit safe, I think. And, uh, and then, of course, it was totally unfashionable it, well, in, I mean, the jazz, in the jazz world in the 80s. That's a really good point, too, that like as the roles become more defined, like the yes. player, just a very specific voice, exactly. like, you know, can, can only be used in a certain way. But yeah, exactly. in a sense, like, you know, it's not like you would call Coltrane to solo on a pop tune. Exactly. Exactly. It's, you know, it's about it's about the individual. And, and the thing is, um, you know, it, be, it became when something becomes a genre. <laughs> then it tends to be that there's a way that you play in that genre, a way that you don't play, and then there's a kind of limitation. I mean, mm -hmm. I think when 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 something becomes too genre specific, you you do lose uh, thing. And, and you know, if you take the guitar and fusion, it became like you know, um, uh, very fast scalic and and kind of with a, with an overdrive sort of American type overdrive sound. And mm -hmm. that became quite, um, you know, standard. <coughs> Just like in heavy metal in the 80s, it became standard sure. to be kind of Joe, Steve Vai, I think. So I'm always looking, well, I'm always, I, I'm not against that. I mean, you know, people do what they do. 
But for me, the interest is when it's not quite mapped out. If you listen to In a Silent Way, it's like people feeling their way through a sort of new thing that they don't really know exactly uh. what's happening. So you can listen to those albums, and particularly Extrapolation, if you listen to it, it's kind of rough. I mean, the guitar playing is rough, but that at the time didn't offend me at all. I thought, well, this is rough playing, but it's so exciting and it's so um, fresh. I don't like yeah. the, word, the word new because new is something you can argue about. But it's fresh, totally fresh. And I that's think it's what you want to hear. And I think in a sense, it's really hard to pass to people like uh, the feeling of zeitgeist. Because you were yes. in the set, and yes. you were alive, and there was a feeling of what happened before and where where it is now, and this need to, <laughs> to step forward. For I don't know, I don't know if you can imagine what it's like for a person growing up, list, discovering Soft Machine, and going back to find out who Miles Davis is. Exactly. Well, that's and, that's great, and uh, and um, I mean, think you know the the, the gap between say your age and, and my age group is massive and one of the massive gaps is the fact that you can hear everything now mm -hmm. we had very little to listen to and if we go say go on to the Django Reinhardt thing for instance you know that story about Keith Richards and Mick Jagger met no. because one of them well one of them had a Muddy Waters album on the bus now in 1962 or one or whatever that would be a huge deal because to get to Mud a Muddy Waters album, you'd have to get into London, find a very specific shop, pay probably a lot of money by the standards <coughs> and get a Muddy Waters album. And that was the same with me, with Janga Reinhardt. And I discovered this Janga Reinhardt thing. There was only two records you could buy and nobody else knew anything about it. So the reason why I, in a way, I don't claim to be a pioneer, but I was at the beginning of the sort of fusion thing, like a lot of people, because I heard Django and I heard Eric Clapton and Hendrix and like oh. a lot of people my age trying to put them together. But the Django thing, everybody went, what's all that? You know, what's that? I said, well, there's this amazing guitarist, you know, and 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 then you'd meet somebody who was also into it. They go, oh, I'm into Django Reinhardt. And that was like meeting a brother because you couldn't find these records anywhere. You couldn't find the music anywhere. Well, you certainly didn't hear it on the radio, obviously. You couldn't find it anywhere. Whereas, <clears throat> and of course, no internet and no, and no search engines. Yeah. I mean, you're, you're 33, aren't you? So you've yeah. grown up being, being able to access music from any era. And in one way, that's great. In another way, it it's very, makes it more difficult for somebody of your generation to actually go, well, I happen to do it this way, you know. So, for instance, the way we all played guitars, if you think of all the people of my uh, late 60s, early 70s mob, technically everybody plays in a weird way because they taught themselves. It's, it's, it's I mean, I see that, like, the way you play guitar. Yeah. I mean, I have, when I... When I grew up, it was a conscious selection of technique. Yes, exactly. It was like exactly. shopping a supermarket of technique. And I exactly. remember your stuff out. The first time I saw you, you were doing, I was a kid, and you were doing uh, a duo at, uh, in London in the Pizza, what's this, some pizza Express uh, with John Williams. With John Williams, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I right. remember seeing the way you were picking, and I was like, oh, it's it's like it's similar to the John you know, to the George Benson thing. Yes, you're holding yes. your pick tip to tip as opposed to like. Oh, maybe up. maybe that's what I'm doing. I, I'm still not totally aware of that. I'm very interesting. I was saying this today. Um, I was 27. I joined. That was before I joined the Soft Machine. I was about 25, 26, and I was playing with a progressive rock band called Daryl Ways Wolf, and I'd got a bit of a rep for being a speedy player, you know. And yeah. this American guy came round and he said, okay, man, he said, now, start playing. So I started playing. He said, what are you doing with your right hand? I said, I don't know. He said, what, are your point, what points of contact have you on the body of the guitar? I said, I don't know. <laughs> and I never <laughs> thought about it because the, particularly the right hand thing, there was no science for that at all when I was growing up. 
And I was, un, uh, I mean, I just learned, I got to my public school. I've never had a lesson in my life. And I got to my school and the guy who was the school hero, who was five years older than me, was a Chet Atkins player. And Chet Atkins was, at that time, the thing. So boom, chink, boom, chink, boom, chink. Uh, but he also uh, played with a pick and he said, you know, and I was like, like doing downstrokes, you know, like you do when you're a kid. And he said, no, 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 alternate picking. And you see, at that time, early 60s, alternate picking was the most advanced thing. And the reason is, of course, because of humbucking pickups and things, because old players, as far as we were concerned, old players had to play downstrokes because the the pickups were so uneven. Uh -huh. And a humbucker, which more or less gave you an even sound. So that was the latest thing. Alternate picking was the latest thing. So, so it, all from the instruments rose your ability to yes, play exactly. accurately. Exactly. It was like coming uh, and, in. And, um, and, and then, of course, I, and of course, I never, I didn't think about it. All I remember, that was the only thing he said, make sure you do alternate picking. You know, make sure he didn't. I don't think he called it that. Maybe he said, make sure you go up and down. So uh, but I was never really consciously practicing the right hand at all. And uh, then, uh, so I wasn't, even though I was, you know, I'd worked up quite a lot of technique, I didn't really know what I was doing. And then yeah. I heard the, the kind of legato players, Ollie Halsall and Alan Holsworth, and I went, oh, bloody hell. So yeah. you don't even have to bloody pick. Because <laughs> I was <laughs> picking every, you know, picking everything with my up and down technique. And I was, I was very fast. But when I heard them, I thought, Bloody hell! You don't, you don't have to, you don't have to pick the damn but thing. Develop sort of very light kind of picking. That that's what I did. I developed, I developed a very light picking technique. And to tell you the truth, if probably if I'd uh, uh, been able to, I would have copied them. But I couldn't for some hmm. reason. My right hand and left hand just went together. <laughs> <laughs> So every note I played, I just somehow had to pick. And I, and now I do quite a lot more hammers on than I did in those days. And I kind of wanted to play like that, but I, I couldn't. So well, I'd already great. Good. Yeah, it's great, isn't it? That's yeah. how you get your individuality. So I actually did grow up. You see, the, the, the earliest Django, of course, I wanted to play fast like Django. So from the moment I was like 13, I was trying to play really fast like Django. Then, of course, McLaughlin, who was also right hand thing. So I was doing a sort of right hand thing and being a bit of a sort of, you know, um, bit of a McLaughliner. And then when I heard uh, the first book, I was a guy called Ollie Halsall. I don't know if you know that name. I, I he was a, he, No, well, he was the sort of before Alan guy. And uh, I remember hearing him and I thought, bloody hell, because he had a great <laughs> kind of overdrive sound and he was hammering away furiously. And I thought. You know, and, and he kind of faded out and Alan kind of really took it on and became the the kind of exceptional kind of legato man. And um, but I remember thinking, bloody hell, I've been practicing away, you know, doing my scales with picking and everything. And these guys are just bloody hammering down. You know, I mean, <laughs> it wasn't that I, th I thought they were cheating. I thought it sounds so great. You know, how brilliant. <laughs> so well, I sort of developed was... a kind of light. Light picking. If you listen, if you listen to particularly say Soft Machine, Alive and Well from like '77, mm -hmm. uh, the way I'm playing on that was the way I kind of the first time I played how I wanted to play, and it is it's it's all picked but light. Yeah, I mean, like, I, I grew up playing with Danny, who was a saxophone player, and Marvin. Yeah, we played all of our picks together, and to me, picking was always. I always thought about it as the same thing as tonguing on a saxophone. Yeah. So right, exactly. Not and, much picking. Yeah, but, and it, well, especially when you get into the '60s, when you get into yeah. and up, and it yeah. seems to me your school of playing and Alan McLaugh even McLaughlin with the picking, the kind of time and the kind of thing that they were trying to put in the phrases was less surgical inside the harmony. Yes, and, exactly. And, and playing in a George Benson y, like, yeah. I don't know, Joe Passy kind of way where you're just maneuvering through the harmony and, and just going from point A's to point B's. And even if yeah. you're playing by the subdivision, it's like, Whoa. yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. This cascading feeling in your lines. 
Yeah. Well, they're very, it's very interesting. And from a technical point of view, of course, you know, George Benson, although he was actually quite young, he, he developed so young, young that he played really the old way, which, of course, is chord tone across mm-hmm. the strings with passing notes. Yeah. And that you have to pick. But once you start get into the Coltrane scale thing, um, on the guitar, you, uh, well, I didn't really, I, I, I mean, these guys, I mean, presumably what happened to Alan and Ollie was that they couldn't pick, so they hammered. Yeah. But um, basically, you know, if you're playing scalically, of course, you don't need to pick it all. But of course, if you, you know, George Benson, Joe Pass, these guys are playing across the strings, like Django, you're across the strings, basically. So George Benson is a sweet picker, Joe Pass is, Django, obviously. Um, so that's an area where, it's, to me, it's a real division between what you might call bebop based, which is chord tones and passing notes, and scale based, which is Coltrane and beyond. And, right. and, and they, you know, they're, they're really a different mindset and uh, require different or, or can yield up different techniques, you know. Well, the, um, the, really, the, I think a lot of people that watch my feed, this is a point I, I keep trying to get across, is that there was a divide in the 60s in the approach in jazz, which is and everything that was really before that was this approach of addressing the chord inside yes. the chord that you are on in, the, yes, in some exactly. way individually and then and after that it was really playing around the entire mode and seeing yeah, exactly the, the exactly past. that's absolutely true yeah kind of blue mm-hmm. was probably the first famous album that showed that and you mm-hmm. know it's a little anecdote i remember i you know kind of blue came out in 1959 i probably bought it in 1972 73 okay and the liner note said, this is a revolutionary album. It involves the use of playing scales. And I went, that's not revolutionary. <laughs> but I didn't, I didn't know any theory. And I, I did my scales and I'd been listening to, you know, McLaughlin and everything. And um, I went, but, but it's all scales, isn't it? And then I realized, of course, that this was the first record where rather than playing, as you say, chord tones, playing off the chord, they were playing scales. And, and you're absolutely right, and I utterly agree that it's a real, a real cutoff point. And if I play, I mean, my bebop playing is not great, but I, I, I do love to do it. Mm-hmm. I approach it in a completely different way. Right. And probably, I mean, I don't adapt my technique that much, but it's, to me, it's a completely different approach because basically it's chord tone and passing note. You never play a scale. Joe Pass would. In, in essence, would never actually play a, consciously play a scale in his heyday. He'd play, you know, and, and the same thing with Django. I mean, you get the chromatic um, scale, but you get very few scale passages. It's well, I think it's that it's so, <clears throat> so integrated into what you need to do at certain points in time, right? So it, it matters where you land. And it matters where you start. And you have to oh, have a picture of the harmony in a very accurate yeah. kind of way. Oh, of course you do. Of course you do. But that's basically what you're doing. Your, your, uh, you, your, your basis is really the skeleton of the chord tone. You know, and you do, you're obviously working around that and you're starting and landing, etc. But <clears throat> when you start playing scalically, and, and, and the problem that uh, when I used to do a lot of teaching in the 80s, and this stuff was kind of not new, but it was getting really big. The problem was people would learn a mode, but they wouldn't know which notes were important. So they'd just right. play it. And the guys would turn up and they'd play over a couple of chords. And it wouldn't sound wrong, but it wouldn't sound right. Because That's with chord, the- tone, yeah, chord tone guidance, you get the actual... So people always go, you know, Django's more melodic than this, that. And you go, well, yeah, part of the reason why it's melodic is because he's so clearly on the chord tones. Exactly. Well, I mean, that's the number one complaint <laughs> people in general against theory is like, you know, I pl- I'm playing this D Dorian and it doesn't sound like anything. But exactly. That's a, lot, that's a lot like a painter blaming uh, blue yes. for looking like the sky. 
exactly exactly you know, well, you know yeah, yeah exactly exactly you have to hold you have to hold the aesthetic and the idea in your mind and know what you're going for that that's just the name of what the thing is yes exactly and you have to be uh, obviously aware but i i do find that that um uh you know if i if i i do think very differently because i do particularly over here i mean of course i do the the sort of stefan grappelli I, I i don't in no way are we a hot club band sweet chorus which is the group i put together to tribute stefan it's absolutely not and um it's and and, and, and it's you know partly actually you know as you're a guitar player and we're talking guitar it's partly because of my alternate picking thing i know perfectly well that i will never ever sound like a a gypsy <laughs> right you know, and and uh used to hang me up but now i accept it so so um uh lost my thread there what, what was i trying to say remind you me what i was saying you were talking about the scale approach and then we went into like talking about the band you yes exactly that. right so with, with that one okay so when i'm playing with that um, that to me is basically the chord tone approach is mm -hmm. what I'm using. If if I'm thinking, I mean, hopefully, you know, I mean, you know, people listening to this will know that when you're actually playing, you're just playing and it comes out how it comes out. But if I was to analyze it, it would be, although I'm not trying to play like Django, because uh, I couldn't, and I'm not trying to play like, um, because, because of my way of playing doesn't really suit trying to imitate that but it's still basically around chord tones whereas when i play with the soft machine i'm thinking very much scalically because most of the solo is over a pedal tone so i think about like loads of substitute scales and things and you have this you've space. got a, you've got a good angle on this picking thing i've seen your stuff you know you know you you i mean you do well, that the thing between you and the pickers is starts with how you it's yeah it, it all stems from the grip of the pick you know the yes. jango is just not holding not holding it from tip to you you do it from tip to tip and that allows a more bensony and articulate really yes. for alternate picking but uh you gotta the, the whole gypsy picking thing is just balancing yes. the, this finger and closing it that way and then you get this curvature yes i think that's right yeah yeah but, i mean i do curve my wrist but i don't and the other thing there's lots of things that people do i mean there was a sort of great vogue for these tiny little picks in jazz and people go, mm -hmm. oh, you've just gone. I pick it. When I tried to play like that, I couldn't. I thought, no, 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 this doesn't suit me at all. But I've got used to the, you know, like <coughs> everybody, you go through a period when you get hung up and think, oh, God, I'm not playing like everybody else. And then you think, well, perhaps that's good. <laughs> yeah, that is good. <laughs> that's very yeah. good. In the also, that's there's some great. There's some great alternate picking players like Pat Martino and that. Usually of my generation, funnily enough, we were the we were the alternate picking generation. The older guys, because of the way you know the guitars were, played you know Eddie Lang, Django Reinhardt, mm -hmm. Charlie Christian. It's down picking. Then we had the alternate picking, which was supposedly the most advanced. And then it went back to kind of um, legato. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Even legato. Yeah, and I mean then. The new guys now, the problem is that a lot of them don't play a lot of shows, don't get the opportunity. We call those people pajamas. Uh, well, exactly. Well, that's the trouble. I mean, you're playing all the time. And, uh, and uh, you know, in my, even in my day, there were people who actually pretty well learnt from playing. Rory Gallagher, for instance. Do you remember, remember Rory Gallagher, the British Bruce. guy? Bruce. Yeah. Well, I mean, he more or less got his shit together on stage i mean when he started with taste it wasn't that great and they just played you know played millions of gigs in the 60s people were playing millions of you were playing seven or eight nights a week you know so you kind of learn on the stand you know you yeah. learn to play playing <laughs> and I, that's the that is uh there's no substitute for that you know really uh you gotta you gotta really want to do it these days uh, yes, and yes, range your yeah. in a way that, that would make sense. Uh, it's it's not not very easy. I got to ask you, John. You played with Stefan Grappelli. Yes. How did this come about? And just oh. tell like well, it's uh, it's ridiculous. A little bit about that's what so a crazy. ridiculous thing. It was just so ridiculous for us. Uh, well, I say ridiculous, us, so amazing. We think about him as a contemporary of like uh, Schumann. 
Yes, exactly. Of course you do. <laughs> well, I'll tell, I'll tell you exactly what happened. Basically, of course, I grew up with um, listening to Django and Stefan. And I thought, I used to think, God, Stefan Grappelli is still alive. Wow. Supposing I met him and we could talk about Django, you know, and, uh, this was anyway. So I was playing. I was playing with the soft machine. I mean, I'd been with quite a few progressive bands and I got in the soft machine, which was a big deal in those days. You know, Alan Holes was left and recommended me and I joined the soft machine. Anyway, we, we were on telly. Uh, with on the television, of course, you know, in the days before all this, being on television was pretty rare and pretty amazing. Uh -huh. Anyway, apparently Diz Disley, who was the guitarist who was running Stefan Grappelli's band, was in Oxford Street or something, and he bumped into an old friend of his, a vibes player called Peter Shade. I'm going to name him because I'm very thankful to this guy, Peter Shade. He was a vibes player. And apparently Diz Disley said, um... I'm looking for a young guitar player. I want to change the band. You know, Ike Isaacs, you know that name? Of course. Yeah, Ike Isaacs was the guitarist. And him and Diz had kind of um, fallen He's out. a relative of mine. <laughs> hey, you're kidding. No. You're kidding. Uh -uh. Wow. Well, Ike was a lovely guy and a beautiful chord player. Yeah, Australia. Very... Australia, right? Australia. Yes, that's yeah. right. He, he, he yeah. lived in Australia. Yeah. And he was a beautiful, lovely, sweet, gentle guy because I got to know him later. And um, beautiful chord player, which Stefan loved, but he wasn't a particularly, I have to say, he wasn't a particularly strong single line player, but that didn't really matter. I think what happened was Diz, who was a very difficult customer, they'd fallen out. So Diz had decided to get rid of Ike Isaacs and was looking for somebody. And I think most of the players of his age, he was late 40s, didn't like him, and they wouldn't work with him because he was, he was, you know, I'm not going to speak ill of Diz because he did me a great favour and he was a good man and, and a very good player in his own way. Mm -hmm. But, you know, he was a funny character. Anyway, so he, he said, this Pete, she said, oh, she said to Pete Shade, you know, and Pete Shade said, well, last night I saw this guitarist on the television. And of course, it was Soft Machine, you know, God's sake. But luckily, I mean, Pete Shade said, oh, this guy was great, you know, really good. You should give him a try. Yeah, exactly. Oh, so suddenly, suddenly, I get a call out of the blue from Diz Disley, who, of course, I knew about because I knew all about Stefan. And he goes, there's Diz Disley here. Can I come round? Uh, we're looking for a guitar player. I went, what? Anyway, turned up. Um, he hadn't got a guitar, obviously. <clears throat> I didn't have even have an acoustic guitar. I had a classical guitar. Uh, I think, actually, I must have found something for him to play. Uh, he played. We played half a chorus of Sweet Georgia Brown. He said, oh, that sounds all right. Now, listen here. We'll go to Hamburg and you'll meet Stefan. And if he likes you, you can join the band. And I, I said, well, I'll come to Hamburg, but I'm actually in the soft machine, see. He said, whoa. That's just a rock band. Never mind that. Anyway, <coughs> so we went to Hamburg. This is a hell of a funny story. I mean, I have told this story quite a lot, but it's so funny. We went to Hamburg and there was a lot of sort of stupidness and nothing much happening. And then uh -huh. about two days after we got there, Grappelli turned up and I was sitting in my hotel room. I'd borrowed an acoustic guitar and there was a knock on the door and Diz Dizzily said, come next door. So I went next door and there was the bass player and me and Diz said right I'm going to get Grappelli now I've thought a lot about this I think he'd told Grappelli that he'd got rid of Ike Isaacs as Grappelli approached the door <coughs> because he came in looking really pissed off <laughs> and, he would look at, and he was very fond of Ike Isaacs he said he really liked his chords because one thing Stefan liked was good chords when he was playing uh -huh. uh, and Ike's chords were lovely so he comes in he wouldn't even look at me and he and he, he, he just talks to Diz Disley won't look at me and he goes right first off we play them their eyes ask him does he know them their eyes so Diz he wouldn't talk to me so Diz went <laughs> yeah, them their eyes. and I went I think so so we started playing chong 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 <laughs> And I, it was in G, and I played A minor D7 for the second chord change. Now, um, he stopped, 
and he didn't look at me. He just went, what is that horrible call? <laughs> you got to go without down the hat. Yeah, you know, without looking at me. And Diz goes, well, John, what was that chord you were playing? I said, well, uh, I think, I'm, I'm not sure, but I think that's what, um, remember, I'm on some horrible, borrowed, cheap acoustic guitar. Um, I think I think that's the chord that um, Django played. And he went, he would never play that horrible chord. <laughs> G, A7, okay, so we get roaring through them, their eyes, a million miles an hour, no solos for anybody, stops, finish. They had, because we had to do five tunes on the television, you see, so we were rehearsing five tunes. Next one, he says, hello, ask him, does he know Manoir de Merev? So this goes, do you know Manoir de Merev, Johnny? I go, oh God, um, I think so. Hello, tell him to accompany me. <laughs> so, so he starts playing, you know, all this stuff. And I've never played a jazz gig in my life. He's playing <laughs> all this stuff. And I'm going plink, plink, plink in D, you know, and he goes, oh, no, oh, no. You do it, Diz. So I'm, I'm thinking, you know, this is a disaster. But How I don't do really you feel mind. in your stomach? Yeah, well, <laughs> I wasn't too bad because, because I was thinking, I'm in the soft machine. I'm not actually going to do this. And. And, and, and it's great that I've met Stefan Grappelli and it's a bit of a shame it hasn't gone very well, but never mind. Anyway, so the next thing he says, oh, let's play You Are the Sunshine of My Life. Stevie Wonder. Okay. Uh -huh. so, so I thought, ah, I do know this. And I brought, as well as this awful steel string acoustic guitar, I brought my nylon guitar, which I was quite used to and I could actually play okay. So... We started up that, and I knew the chords, and I thought, I actually know this better than they do. And I was kind of playing the right chords, and, and I felt a little more confident. And then he, he motioned to me to do a solo. So I, I did my sort of 1976 hot licks, right? <laughs> and we finished the tune, and he turned around to me, he goes, oh, I like that. He said, I like it. He says, I like that fast stuff, that fast business. He says, that's very good. It amuses the tourists. <laughs> <laughs> and then after that, he was fine. And I, I walked into this, and, and I overheard him. I, walk, I walked into lunch, and I heard him saying to um, the, the bass player, oh, I like this boy. I like him. Some ways, oh. I, he's better than I like him some ways. So he got to like me straight off, and then everything after that was fine. You know, and we awesome. played, and it was all good, and he used to chuck me on the cheek. And so it was hilarious. It was a complete disaster. And the power it, of shred saves lives. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, in 76, it was, you know, he, he was quite taken with it. And basically then, of course, I was supposedly still with a soft machine. So I went to them and said, look, I've been offered this three-month world tour with Stefan Grappelli. What gigs have you got? And they didn't have any gigs. They had one gig um, in three months, and Alan Holdsworth did it. It was in Portugal. So I went off on this three-month thing with Grappelli and then didn't leave four or five years. And wow. It was, you know, he, was, he was absolutely wonderful. Such a great guy. Great guy to work with. Wonderful. So That's easy and, and beautiful. And we played everywhere. And we, played at, we used to do two tours of the States every year. It was just heaven. It was really, really good. And, and you know, you, you, you're, you're a side man, but you're allowed to play as much as you want, you know. And he wanted you to play, partly because he was very generous, partly because he was quite happy to sit back on his chair at the age of 70-odd and let you play, you know. And so, and he, and he loved the gun. Because I thought I was 27, you know. And he just, you were 27? I was. I was already 27, yeah. Because wow. I'd been the soft machine and all that, so I was, I was, I was. Everybody thought because everybody else was so old, they thought I was nineteen. But you know, I was still, I was, you know, quite, quite. I'd been around, you know. Yeah, but well, I mean, apparently yeah. the age that he was when you met him. I know. Don't. I know. <laughs> don't. Don't. And I used to look at him and I think, fucking, okay, no, it's incredible. Sorry, it's incredible. No, this no, old guy right. could. That an old guy can still play, you know, and I was going, wow, he's amazing. He can still actually stand up. Yeah. <laughs> I know I, I always tell that people that when, when, when we were doing the sweet chorus, then I said, I'm now the age he was. 
That's and quite a lot of the. Quite and a you're lot of still the rocking and rock and soft machine with a yes rock yes. tone. Rock and yes, hard. exactly. I well, tone. I mean, you see, that's what I love. When we reformed Soft Machine, uh, that's what I really loved because I have not had a lot of opportunities since the sort of early '80s, really, to turn up the amp and go for it because. You know, I, I do. You know, I'm not saying I, 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 I don't go for it. Obviously, I always go for it. But with that soft machine thing, it's like somehow I feel the spirit of it when I'm playing, which is like, you know, I've said recently in a few interviews that sometimes I like to play as well as, you know, giving it the old full on. I, I like to play sometimes as if I was Sid Barrett in, 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 in hippie days. You know, in other words, pick up the guitar and just press a pedal and see what happens. And, and I can do that in soft machine. It's just a sort of experimental thing. We do a lot of, uh, kind of like, uh, improvisations from nothing, uh, which are kind of rocky rather than jazzy. This but, is something people don't understand. I think profoundly about fusion is that in some ways it's, it could be the emptiest canvas there is for a yes, solo. Because, exactly. No harmony. It's exactly. just playing on a note and a groove. Yeah. And that's yeah. it. Lovely. And it's lo it. I love that. You know, there are a few musicians I've, I've worked with, um, Stefan Grappelli, for instance, and Pat Matheny, who I did a little bit with, who hate playing over one 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 tone. They, they actually yeah. want to play this. Yeah, Stefan <laughs> they, they're real hard. They're harmony people. And Stefan Grappelli, after eight bars, he just stop and say, well, where is the chord? What do I play now? This, and, and this this thing is impossible to explain to some to, to people who grew, to to young people now because the thing that Hendrix did playing on an E chord or an yeah. E note really for seven minutes and yeah. diving into it seems like the beginning of music to a lot of people that yes. are growing up now. But yes. to think that if you were around and the year was 1910 or 1902 and you just wanted to play with other people, there was not a single context in Western music that didn't have chords. Absolutely. It, None it, at all. So, so the way that like this kind of playing <clears throat> developed, if you're playing on a one, yeah. six, two, five, people would just play around the chords. Exactly. Exactly. They, they would. It would, they it would. would. But this thing, yeah, it's, it's some sort of mixture of Coltrane and Indian music. Yeah. And, yes. Yes, absolutely. And Everything. funnily enough, I remember being with Stefan Grappelli and uh, we were at the promoter's house and he put on some Ali Akbar Khan, right? Oh, yeah. And okay, so Stefan, it started up and he goes, oh, I like it. And then after about probably a minute, he goes, oh, there are no chords. Take it off. <laughs> <laughs> he got bored. <laughs> he gave me, he gave me the bulb. Take it off. That's so really, funny. I know yeah. it's so funny. It was he was a complete harm. He loved harmony, and of course, the violin is not a particularly harmonic instrument. So he really loved the piano. That's what he loved. He played the piano brilliantly. Yeah, was and playing he, and he played, yeah, yeah. yeah. Nice. I mean, he, but he played much better than that later on. And mm -hmm. uh, he he loved the piano. He loved harmony. And if we'd ever rehearse with the piano, he'd work out all these substitutions of things and mm -hmm. then of course he'd forget what he worked out and so uh, <laughs> when we got on stage he'd go oh well okay and we just we we never rehearsed we just busked we had that rehearsal in Hamburg we had so one or two you know we just got on stage and played the tunes and um, because he had no memory now I know what that's like now <laughs> <laughs> he, 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 if you got an arrangement uh, organised He'd mess it up. He'd never play anything unmusical, but he'd just play through it. And then he'd come right. off stage and go, Oh, I forgot the orange mob. Oh, I'm so sorry. Oh, I was thinking of something else. Um... That's so funny. Well, after 70 years, like you're used to yeah. it. The way it's hard, hard to get new, I, I, I would assume. But let yes, me ask you this. Course, you, go on. I'm assuming you have some amazing. Like Django stories, you must have talked about him, oh, and he was a character. Please he, tell me. 
the Lantier, uh, Stefan was very peculiar talking about Django. The thing wow. was, if he uh, if he was asked a direct question, he would often not reply properly because he felt, first of all, they were like chalk and cheese as people, you know. Mm-hmm. So Stefan was now the the funny thing about uh, this relationship is. Capelli was on the streets of Paris alone from the age of about nine or ten. So in that sense, he was like really what we imagine a gypsy to be. He was on his own, making his own way, making do, finding out that music was a way he could make money and get food. So a very, very, he never talked about it, but I mean, it must have been obviously an incredibly disadvantaged childhood. Now, Django, of course, was brought up with the adoration of females as the great prince. So, Grappelli always used to say, oh, no, he was such a snob. He said, <laughs> when we play in the cafes, he would not take the hat around. I had to do it. So, in a way, in a, in a way, he was the gypsy. He was the one who was having to make do. And so he was permanently anxious Whereas Django, I think, was extremely confident. So Uh this led to a lot of problems. And there's a a story which I will tell. It might, um, uh, no, it won't upset people, but it's uh, it's something that Stefan... Everybody dead twice over. Yeah, everybody knows Django. What a genius. In fact, even Steph, I must say, before I tell this story, which is is not a musical story, but, but, you know, uh, I, sometimes Stefan would give me a lift back in his limousine or something from the gig and I'd say, Stefan, what are you going to do uh, next week? He said, oh, well, I'm making a record with Urbelis or I'm making a record with Barney Kessel or I'm making a record with Joe Pats because every guitarist wanted to make a record with Stefan. Right. So I'd say, oh, that'd be great. He said, well, it'll be okay. He'd go and make the record, come back and I might see him three weeks later. I said, how was that recording? He said, well, it was okay, but he said, listen, Django was alive, he would kill them all. <laughs> very, very proud of him. But, so this story, yeah. for instance, okay, so let's say this is probably about 1937. Stefan, who got all the gigs, hello, he never did anything, he was, <laughs> I get all the work. So Stefan, who was a real street, you know, got all the work. They got a very important very prestigious gig at the Elysee Palace, which is where the president would hang out. Okay. <clears throat> so this is a very well paid, very important gig from the terms of the Monet. And they arrive and there's no sign of Django. Okay. Oh. So, so Stefan's getting oh, to himself. Well, amazing. Well, you know, and they come up and they say, well, you know, Mr. Grappelli, um, you know, where's Miss, Miss Mr. Reinhardt? We need to find him. He says, and he goes, I have an idea. Give me a car and I will go and find him. So they give him an official car. And as the car goes out the gate, the sentry, the guard at the gate, salutes the car because it's an official car. They go out. <coughs> they go to Montmartre. They go to a billiard hall. And there's Django playing billiards. Oh, come on, you car. You know, <laughs> get in the car. So they bundle Django in the car. <laughs> And they drive back, and as they drive past, the guard sal- looks in the car and salutes. And Django turns to Stefan, and he says, you see, even here they recognize my genius. <laughs> <laughs> I said, he didn't say that. He said, he did. He said it. He said it. He was so conceited. <laughs> That's awesome. Isn't that oh, my that God. Great? But he had, you know, he had... That's the real, you know, and he had lots, lots of stories about that. He basically found him very difficult because he wasn't, because of this security he had, you know, he, he, he didn't really care. Whereas Stefan cared desperately because Stefan, was, even when I knew him, was worried about the next meal. He was mm-hmm. so used to being poor. As a, as a, a, even when you're successful, yeah. Yeah, even when he was successful, he was looking around. But to him, Rick, a rich person was a good person. Rich equaled good. So he'd, he'd lean over to you and say, that guy there, he's very rich. You see? And that meant 
you know, he said, we must play well tonight because he's very rich. <laughs> <laughs> so he never felt secure, except when he played the violin. He was absolutely at home with the violin and yeah. with the music. The rest of the time, he was very anxious because, you know, it's how your childhood is. Child is father to the man. And Django's childhood was idyllic, actually. Yeah. We don't think of, uh, uh, you know, Manoush as having an idyllic life, but he would have had his mother, uh, women fawning over him, you know. So he, he was very, very secure in himself. And, of yeah. course, you know, had his genius as well. So he was a very, very confident man. Whereas poor mm -hmm. Stefan. <laughs> so, you know, so they really had, uh, in that sense, I mean, of course, he, he, he loved him musically. As I said, he'd say, you know, Django would kill everybody. If he was still alive. He really but, would. Well, he yeah, would. exactly. Of course he would. Of course he would. So he, he you know, he knew. And the other thing w which uh, caused um, a little bit of resentment was when Django died in 1953, uh, they started putting out records with Django's name big and no mention of Stefan, or sometimes with Stefan Grappelli small and, you know, and he didn't like that. And the 1950s were very diff difficult for Stefan. The 1950s, early 60s, nobody was very interested. He was working in hotels and things. You know, he was a very pragmatic man. He didn't mind working in hotels, mm -hmm. but you know, he was conscious that everybody was going on about Django when really <clears throat> they'd been an equal partnership. So this he was very happy when he had this revival that started around 1973. And, uh, you know, I remember we toured America and every time we toured, you know, it would go up, the audiences would go up and up and up. And it was like it's, being part of a new band, successful it's band. Becoming, it's becoming very large now. Uh, that's yeah. something oh, no, it's we can low huge. down. Yeah, Huge. Sweet Lowdown was a Woody Allen was a real turning point for the style of that movie. Yes, probably, probably. And after that, I think that was mo that was my first introduction to the style. I didn't know it was. Was the it? Yeah. Was it? Yeah. Really. So you were about what? This about twenty years ago. So you were like, you must have been a teenager. You were a teenager. Yeah, exactly. Then, That's so interesting. And it was Django from that, and the first thing I was introduced to was Jimmy Rosenberg. Uh, wow. After. What a genius. But he, yeah. poor old Jimmy that, Rosenberg, it went all wrong I, for him. Yeah, I actually have, uh, on this feed, I have a lot of gypsy players that just talk about the style. And uh, to me, it's fascinating. First of all, when you say people in the 60s weren't aware of what they're doing, you yeah. guys are like rocket scientists compared to the amount of dialogue that goes into learning gypsy music oh, i they, know they, they don't talk about it they oh, just they don't talk, no they don't talk they about don't it, talk no. about music, they don't talk about anything and it's <clears> very <throat> funny because i think my i have a theory about it and it's it's almost i was just talking to my dad about it today they're probably going to resent me for saying it but in a way the style and the, these are great players so i don't mean any disrespect by it but it's a lot like Elvis impersonators, uh, yeah. you know, and, and then yeah. you really celebrate the micro differences. Well, exactly. Because exactly. You know, all a slight problem I had. I mean, I did uh, quite a lot of touring with Birelli and, uh -huh. um, you know, which I was very fortunate, to, which, which, which was amazing because uh, that came out of the blue as well. I did an album with Vic Juris. Yeah. You know, Vic? Vic just over in well, New York, and I, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Great play. And Vic and I did an album. And uh -huh. the idea of um, uh, we wanted to tour, or, or the promoter wanted to tour us. The, the woman who did the album wanted to tour us. And we, we, she wanted to get to gigs in Germany. And, and neither of us were well enough known to support a decent tour. So she got Borelli, who she'd also recorded. And this is all so together? We, yeah, like we, a, so we played all together, the three of us. And uh, the thing about Borelli, which was um, <clears throat> apparently absolutely um, standard, and, and I know from, I did some duos with him, and then we did some trios, is that he is absolutely, first of all, he's not interested in rehearsing. He's not interested in talking about any of this stuff. He's not interested in, in figuring out endings or something. He just wants to play. Mm -hmm. So you play. That's what you do. 
So I think they're all similar. They don't want to discuss the techniques or the. the I don't. They, they have they have the words for it, and I think also when you when you grow up in a world that's all licks. Yes. This, this is the thing about about Django and about uh, when Jan- the whole thing of Gypsy Jazz didn't come about until a marketing thing after he died. But the thing the thing yes. we started the conversation with, which is. In essence, the thing that makes the greatest jazz people is how uniquely individual they are. Well, exactly. Other, no such thing as style, exactly. other than just one person's interpretation of jazz. So I'm sure in Django's mind, he was just improvising and playing jazz to the exactly. best of his ability. And they exactly. made a style out of it. So now exactly. they're beyond the licks. What is there? So they don't talk about how they do it and hope that this new thing will form around it. Because if they do, they'll all just there will just be one way of doing it and they'll all play the same. Well, that's the, that's the issue. And, and, and I think in a way, um, like a lot of these things, the important thing about Django gets lost. Now, the thing, thing that occurs to me, uh, well, so much occurs about him, doesn't it? But he became, in a way, way less gypsy, more jazz as he developed. Mm-hmm. You know, so the first recordings have a lot of, you know, you know, uh, pyrotechnical, uh, blazing stuff. And as you go through, and I'd say his heyday was probably actually fun enough in the war. Um, it, it becomes more jazz, and you can see in that film of him playing, right? You know, the film. Yeah, well, of course uh-huh. you did. Yeah. The, the the film. You can see that he's thinking, right? He's thinking. He's not going. Oh, the next lick's coming up now. He's thinking like Borelli does when he's playing really well. You can see the mind going. And sometimes with some some some, some players, I, I feel, right, everything's sorted. They've got all the licks. They're absolutely amazing. But there's no surprise. And To me, it, it's, it's the way you train yourself. My suspicion is always that people that see transcription and lick learning or mm. solo learning as the end game can't get mm-hmm. past a certain point because they can't learn from licks. They can just learn the licks. So you're yes. constantly in this state of not breaking something into it, the elements that make it, and you can't be well, organized. Exactly, into- exactly, Danny. I mean, the, the, the interesting thing about jazz, and because I do a lot, I, I do this stuff with, say, John Williams, for instance, uh, you know, classical guys, and rock guys to a certain extent, and perhaps what you're saying about is that, that actually jazz guys have a kind of theoretical knowledge. You know, I mean, some of my favorite players, like, say, John Schofield or something, you can tell he's, he knows what he's doing. You know what I mean? If, from a theoretical point of view. Mm-hmm. So I think uh, uh, Borelli, because he's got such an incredible ear and he can do it, but I I think uh, a lot of those guys have learned, as you say, learned the licks brilliantly, but they don't have a theoretical background of what they're doing, so they can't vary it. For exactly. instance, if you know you're playing a G- G7 arpeggio, uh, you can, you know, uh, put a ninth in or put a thirteenth and make a decision, you know. And I think that's not an option for for a, a lot of the guys playing. But you've got to remember, it, it really is like a folk music mm-hmm. and the point of folk music is tradition and the point of tradition is continuity so really it's not your job to change things your job is to carry on the tradition uh, and but I, it's, a different, that, it's a different kind of appreciation it's the difference between uh appreciating a sculpture and appreciating a beautiful rock formation they, their thing yes. tends to be more connected it's just something you find in nature it doesn't break to pieces Right. So interesting. Okay. You mean I see what you mean. You're saying there's no conscious art in it. Yeah. Well, I, yeah. Well, I mean there <laughs> is in a way, but there's so much chaos in the forming of the player, which is I, I you see it because it's a it, the, the way they manufacture players is identical. Yeah. They teach them chords, so they have yes, some that, sort of vague understanding and internalization of form, and yes, then they, they, it, it's just try, you know learn this like. The way they practice is repeating till excellence, and then after that, worry about application. I'm talking to yes. uh, Gizmo Graf on here on yeah. Monday, and he's one of these like burning, like just yeah, you know, one of those yeah. Jimmy Rose types. 
it's like the way that these people learn. It's just yeah. re repeating licks till they sound perfect. They're technically brilliant, right? Just yeah. no, no fluff. All, oh, no, all no. I mean, and then I they envy them. Because they, yeah, because they start, they start at a young age and they're told exactly what to do. So before they're, by the time they're 13 or 14, they're completely conversant with right. Uh, but thing. the thing that you really see is that it's very hard to cross over to other styles. Like you, because of, I think because of the way you latch on to music. Yeah. Was, okay, soft machine. But once you have, I think it's the scale thing, the the modal yeah. thing, really. Because yeah. it's not it's not even like scale. To me, like a mode is the group of notes plus a tonal center, right? It's like the the, the idea of understanding that yeah. harmony is yes. being on okay. reapply, okay. and then you can. So that approach that approach is kind of broader and it lets you go into the other thing maybe maybe yes. not to play like george benson or joe pass yeah like that surgical way but you, you would survive the gig and they would have a much harder time going into soft machine if you make oh, oh they certainly were, they certainly were, well, but really one well, to get back to it actually well the, just to finish up this uh, that sure. topic i was thinking about Borelli, and of course i was just talking to uh, i i actually happened to meet a guy today who makes gypsy style guitars and he goes to Samoa and a lot and he says of course I mean I think the last time Borelli turned up Samoa he turned up and played a Strat <laughs> playing fusion you know really? and of course they they he you know he he he'll take it but I mean they really get the hump you know uh -huh. particularly I think you know he told me that they they get the, they get when I mean to say the hump it's an English expression meaning they get pissed. They get they they're angry. They say Pirelli's betraying the cause. You know he's playing electric guitar, and but he's always done that. He's always huh. been a rebellious spirit. In fact, he left the community for quite a long time, and he's got a, you know, I know from back on to know tour. quite well. He's he's yeah, back in the day in the '89 we toured, and he 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 was quite at that time quite disillusioned with the the culture. And uh, he 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 sort of almost consciously abandoned it, and that's why he was playing electric guitar and playing fusiony stuff, and as well as his musical curiosity. But then, of course, he went back to it and was absolutely killing. You know, the, his his Gypsy Project record looked like fantastic. I love but, that. Yeah, oh, it's incre incredible. But he, well, he is a guy, a guy like Django. Even was going for something external from the culture. Of he to was. But that's what I'm saying. He became more jazz. Less, less stuck in the culture. So, you know, it's it's so uh, that's why I said it's it's to me in a way it's a it's a folk tradition. And the important thing about folk, folk tradition is always that you keep the flame going and you carry on the tradition. In other words, if you break the mold too much, you're doing the wrong thing. Where of course in jazz we look to people to have individuality. Sometimes we look for that too much. Because there's a nice balance between respect for tradition and continuity and individual expression. And hopefully, uh, you know, I mean, some of the particularly, uh, you know, because this is a cultural thing. I mean, if we'd been talking in the 1970s, which we couldn't have done on Skype, right. the difference between English culture and American culture were quite big in the 70s. Very big. You know, we weren't brought up. To express ourselves individually i mean i think it's it's almost in the dna of every american to say well i do my thing you know <laughs> i do i wasn't brought up like that and and um i mean luckily i i uh i was brought up in a in a kind of strict uh way but then the 60s happened so it was like a like a meltdown of the old-fashioned way and then the 60s so I think this is where you got a lot of this intense music from because it was, it was, it was a bloody conflict of, of the way people were brought up. I mean, if you listen to, I was just listening to um, playing a friend of mine. There's a, a, well, there are hundreds of millions of recordings of Eric Clapton doing Stepping Out, but there was one from 1966. And, you know, I, I'm quite big on this thing because I, when I saw Clapton in 1965, that was, just, I mean, I'd heard Django, obviously, and I love Django, but seeing this live and nobody, and I can tell you this, because only somebody my age knows this, that he invented the whole shit. 
Uh -huh. The Let's Pull a Marshall started with him. And when I heard that, I didn't know what was going on. I mean, I heard a bloke going, like singing with the thing. And we'd never heard anything like that. And I was playing um, uh, a friend of mine today. There's a uh, Stepping Out 1966 live from Clute's Clique. And the kind of intensity of the playing is, and, and it's not a style. He's not going, you know, we're so used to this style that when, when you hear it, you go, oh, yeah, 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 we know this way of playing. This wasn't a style. This was him burning from his repressed, unhappy childhood combined with his blues feeling, combined with getting this incredible sound, just burning. And and it's yeah. to do, oh, it's my point is, it's people like Clapton, it's Jeff Beck, who were brought up in this really repressed atmosphere of, yeah. the, of, of Britain in the 1950s, after the war. All of a sudden, it was, it's melting away. Yeah, exactly. And, and so you, they and had this intensity, a real, real power. And, and also... Obviously, Hendrix had it as well, but but I mean, uh, you know, uh, it was really Eric first, and Does, Jeff Beck. Jeff like Beck take, was. I thought. Sorry. Say again. Sorry, Jeff I thought Beck. you. No, no. Oh, all Jeff, saying, like, Jeff Beck. Wait. I saw. Jeff Beck. I I saw his first gig with the Yardbirds. I saw all the all these people when they were just starting, and Jeff Beck with the Yardbirds. I saw his first gig. I think in '64 or one of his first gigs in a little club, and. They were all playing Telecasters. That was the go-to guitar um, with the back pickup, quite screechy. Uh -huh. um, but he, he, he was, you know, people don't change. He was almost exactly the same as he is now, but without, you know, how he's refined it. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, he was, so it was a screechy town. And then I'd heard Clapton with the uh, Yardbirds playing a Telecaster. And, you know, I thought, yeah, that's okay. And then I went to see went to see him. A friend of mine said, go and see him again. And I went, oh, yeah, yeah, he's a good player. Yeah. And it was this Les Paul Marshall thing. And it was just incredible. And the thing was, you know, to get back to the point, it's about this way that we were brought up in the 1950s and early 60s. I mean, it was really clamped down where I don't think American young people ever quite had it that repressed because I think Americans mm -hmm. were always brought up to express themselves. I yeah. think they always have been brought up more or less to express themselves. Well, if any, well probably the, the generation of Americans of Charlie Parker and Dizzy Gillespie. Well, okay, that's different. And, and yeah. particularly, you know, black black people in, in that period was obviously a thing that we can't but even. It's, but it's a similar it's a similar kind of thing. Just uh, yes, it is. To, to, it go, is. to go on stage and really, you know, put some sort of emotional baggage into your, yes, <laughs> into exactly. Your exactly, 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 exactly. We all do it, but I mean, I, I think you know Leonardo when he put this thing together with us with the soft machine in about 2004. I I met him for the first time, and he was then about 40 and he he sort of was saying about this special thing that my our generation did and at the time i didn't really know what he was talking about but now i do because it it's nothing to do with ability technique musicianship it's about a certain heat that came from this as you say you're talking about parker as well um came from this i'm not talking about me individually but came from this you know, British men in the 1950s were not encouraged to speak. Yeah. <laughs> As well, a child, you were expected to shut up and you'd get a kick if you said anything to your dad or something. You know, I didn't. But, I mean, that's how somebody like Jeff Beck would have been brought up. And you can tell. And he plays, man. You can see it. I can see his uh, horrible alcoholic dad kicking him, you know, because he's got so much... Ooh, Right. <laughs> and I think so I think that was a, a very English phenomenon and I, I think the power of those people was, was an English thing and I think uh, you know obviously this is nothing to do with talent this is how, how things are expressed and of course for every Jeff Beck every Eric Clapton there's a million destroyed personalities <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
who never got to express anything. You know, it's true. It's well, true. to make thing beautiful with it is a whole other story. Well, of course they did. You it see, that was also great. a perfect storm because you got this instrument for the first time that had yeah. that power, the electric guitar through the through exactly. the marsh. That exactly. was just like you're 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 on this emotional journey, but you're also steering this brand new vessel exactly. that no that is to saw before. Exactly. That's so, very well said. Very, very well said. That's very well put because that's what it was. And that's why, you know, to me, uh, uh, genius is something that I do feel that genius is something that goes through people and can disappear, whereas talent stays forever. So I'd say yeah. somebody like Clay had had a moment of a year or two of absolute genius. And then he carried on as a talented musician. Well, that's a think Hendrix well, obviously had genius, but then he died. Django, <laughs> I tell you, tell you the truth. I mean, there again, this might get me in trouble, but uh, to me, Django had genius all the way until kind of late forties. Then I, then I think he was, he was so great. The electric guitar tracks, which I love, you know. But to me, that's just a very talented musician. Whereas. You feel it in the 1930s. Some of those solos, you feel this is genius. This is absolute genius. Imagine the circumstances of living in that time in those places. Yeah. Like, it's exactly. mind blowing. The whole world was yeah. coming oh, apart. Absolutely. Well, God, I mean, really, I mean, we've, we've got no idea. And I think a lot of the foolish things that are happening in the world now that everybody's forgotten, they've forgotten. The 1940s well, and the, yeah, well, most people weren't around. You can't remember. Uh, yeah, exactly. Well, exactly. But you know, it, Trump it, and Brexit it, and all these idiocies uh, to do with people just going. Well, there's nothing to worry about, but there is stuff to worry about. You know, oh, yeah. and, you know, things. You know, things can go can go oh. really wrong. Even in America, oh, things can go yeah, really yeah. wrong. It, 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 the fabric of society could be unraveled in a, in a moment. It, exactly. It's, you it's know, pretty, and, uh, and I don't know personally, but because I was born just after it had unraveled, although not so much in England, but the whole of Europe was unraveled. You know, I, I was born in 1948, and that is, it was completely unraveled at the time of my yeah. birth. So, so I think I that? understand instinctively you know that's why i hate this you know the whole trump thing and the brexit thing it's just foolishness and it's like it's almost like people will put up with this foolishness because it, deep down they think it was all a joke really it's not a joke it's not a joke it's it's bad news anyway danny yeah i've got to yeah. go now it's great John. talking to you so so much, that was lovely uh, we was, could talk we could so, talk forever we could talk yeah, forever let's do this again sometime i think a lot yeah, of people yeah sure man Sure, yeah. sure. It's great talking to you and great playing. Like, and I'm sure you're, you're, not even you're playing. The thumbs are playing. Sorry, <laughs> we're not even saying of the of the stories you have. Oh, I know exactly. And and uh, you know, and it was great to hear you playing. And uh, and presumably you're playing tons of gigs as you normally no, do. Yeah, this isn't about you. This is about you, man. I mean, we just want to. Yeah. we're all fans, and we want to hear what you have to say. Great, man. Okay, lovely, Danny. Lovely stuff. I'll see you soon. Bye, man. Bye. Bye. Bye.